Hello everybody. Today we'll be discussing the paper called Type to Fuzzy Sets and Systems: An Overview by Jerry M. Mandel. We'll also be having some uh, additional discussions on interval type two, intuitionistic, and hesitant fuzzy systems. So first off, what is a fuzzy set? There's a lot of data out there, and uh, we need to be able to model the uncertainty that's there in the data. We need to be able to handle this uncertainty, you know, reduce or minimize the effect of this uncertainty. And fuzzy sets are an enabler for the same. Uh, fuzzy sets are sets whose elements have a certain degree of membership or a degree of non-membership and we use this mathematical technique to be able to make better use of uncertainty and understand what information is around us. Uh, we do this so that we can make better machine learning models so that we can make better inferences from the data we have. Now we discussed uncertainty, something that we need to handle, something we need to model and minimize. But what actually is uncertainty? Uncertainty can be of two types. Uncertainty is generally either linguistic or random, uh, wherein linguistic means the uncertainty related to words, you know, related to notions. Some word can mean something for you. It might mean different for me. Hot for you might be 35 degrees Celsius. It might be 25 degrees Celsius for me. And that's the linguistic variability we need to capture. Randomness, on the other hand, deals with unpredictability, deals with, you know, air variances in number. And to deal with these kinds of uncertainties, we need to use some mathematical modeling. Randomness is something we've been dealing with for a long time. You know, we've been using probability theory to deal with random uncertainty since forever. And how we do this is we, by employing PDFs, right? We make probability dis uh, distribution functions. These probability distribution functions are based on moments and there are an infinite of them. There are an infinite amount of them. And it's not really easy to model out an infinite amount of moments so what we try and do is we try and find the best fit ones. We try and encompass all information, you know, try and get everything we can from the data uh, in the least amount of moments. And we do that by using the first two moments, which are mean and variance. Now mean is very easy to understand. We've been going over mean for a long time. Mean seems very simple to calculate. There's not much complexity there, but why, why take in variance? Variance is necessary to be able to understand the way, you know, the dispersion around the mean, to be able to understand the spread that certain data has around an average value, around a mean value. And these values are heavily used and heavily weighted in, you know, recognizing the modeling of certain uncertainty. We always discuss the mean and variance associated with certain data when we're trying to model it. But this is, this is very simple and this is something we've been using for random uncertainty for a long time. How do we capture linguistic uncertainty. That's the harder part. So what we'll try and do is we'll try and draw an inference between the probability theory and understanding the uncertainty in linguistic variables. What we'll do is we'll find some mean for our, for our linguistic data and we'll also try and find some variance for our uncertain data. Some, you know, some degree of dispersion that our uncertain data has. This is the work that Zeta did in the year 1975. He developed fuzzy sets in 1965, which are now called as a type of fuzzy sets. But in 10 years time, in 1975, he came up with the type two fuzzy sets, also known as the fuzzy fuzzy sets. Fuzzy sets with a fuzzy nature to the membership functions, some grade to their membership functions. These new functions that were, uh, that Zeta came up with 10 years later had more capability to model uncertainty, capture uncertainty and be able to deal with it. They, they were great at minimizing uncertainty in linguistic data. And that's where we need to discuss the fuzzy theory. Now, some people might not have a background in uh, fuzzy theory. So we we'll just will do a simple refresher on uh, the membership function and you know what a general type fuzzy type one fuzzy set looks like. Uh, what we can do is we can probably uh, try out an example and let me pick up my markers and my text boxes. So what let's let's do this. Uh, let's think about students, right? Let's let's form a set called G and uh, set G is a set of all good students that are there in a class. Uh, and you know what? While we're at it, let's make a set called P for all the bad students that are in the class. And our metric for uh, understanding good students and bad students would be the marks. So we need some data and we need some students. Let's, let's create some students. Um, hmm. Let's go for student A, scored 98 marks out of 100, right? And student B, he scored 80 marks out of 100. Uh, let's go for a student C that scored 
60 marks out of 100 and let's go for a student D that only scored 35 marks out of 100. Now we have some students and we have some sets, right? What we're trying to do now is we're trying to, you know, encapsulate these students in these sets. We want to, uh, you know, allot a student to a certain set. So what we, we'll, we'll make use of fuzzy theory for this. You know what, let's, let's form a fuzzy set. So our fuzzy set, uh, you know, let's drag it up here. Our fuzzy set G is going to look like this, right? So we're going to have uh, student A. And student just scored 98 marks, right? It, he feels like a good student. It looks like he's a good student. Let's allot some membership value to it. You know what? I'm 0.9% sure that he belongs into the good students category. Let's encompass student B as well. Student B scored 80 marks. He's probably a good student. I'm not too sure, but I'm not I'm not saying he's a bad student. But yeah, he, he looks like a good student. Let's go for student C. He scored only 60 marks. You know what? I'm really half uncertain about it. And student D, he scored really low. I'm pretty sure he's not a good student. We made a fuzzy set, right? So this is what a fuzzy set would look like. A type one fuzzy set would look like. You have your values that are, you know, elements over here. In our case, they're students. And you have certain membership value allotted to each student. So for the set good student, there's a membership value of 0 0.9 to student A, which means that student A is very definitely a good student. But to the student number D, there's only a membership value of 0 0.1, which means... We are very certain he's not a good student. We can similarly form a set for uh, bad students. So what we'll do is, I'll just quickly copy this to make it easier. And we'll make a set for bad student. Let's go for B. Now, we'll edit this up here. Okay, let's do this. So, uh, student B. We need to allot some membership values to student B, right? So you need to know, uh, so membership values are always additive to one, right? If there are two sets, good and bad students, and we know that the membership value for student A being in the good set is 0 0.9, then certainly the membership value for the student being in set B, bad students, would be 0 0.1. And similarly, we can easily allot some values to all of these students for being in the bad set. And that's how you basically fuzzy find this data that you had you know, you made fuzzy sets, you made two fuzzy sets, good student and bad student, and now you've encompassed all your data. And that's what this membership function looks like. If you would want to plot them out here, you'll probably look like this, you know, so you'll have one student who has probability value, uh, membership function of 0 0.1, someone who has 0 0.3, someone with a 0 0.5, and you know, so on and so forth, you can form as many of these as you want. So that's what your basic membership function looks like. This is this is not a proper Gaussian function, but this is similar to a Gaussian function. Uh, moving on, we'll now try and understand. So we saw a type one fuzzy set here. How different is a type two fuzzy set? You know what? We know that it encompasses more probability, more uncertainty. It gives us more information than a type one fuzzy set, but how much more information? And for this, we we'll use an example that uh, Jerry Mendel gave in his paper. So Jerry Mendel discussed the idea of eye contact, right? If you can arrange the values and I, you know, if you can quantify eye contact and you can uh, give it a range, let's say zero to 10, and you uh, go around and you ask people as to what they believe would uh, some eye contact be. So let's say for me, some eye contact, I would give units three to five uh, as the range for some eye contact. If I have unit three eye contact to someone, I can say, you know what, we had some eye contact. But maybe for you, some eye contact might lie in the range 5 to 6. You might say that if you have 5 units of eye contact with some other person, you had some eye contact, wherein some eye contact is a linguistic variable, right? Some eye contact, as you can see over here, is a linguistic variable. Now we need to encompass this. You know, somebody told me that the value 5 is some eye contact. Somebody told me that the value 2 is some eye contact. How do I you know, model this out? How do I quantify it out? So what we'll do is we'll try and make a type 2 fuzzy set. And for this, First off, we'll take average values, right? What we'll do is we'll take, we'll average out all probability, like all uh, range values that we got, and we'll find some average values for some eye contact. And then we'll try and model out the dispersion we talked about. The, the ability to model out dispersion is what makes type two fuzzy sets unique and more powerful and more computationally efficient. So we'll try and understand how we can model out this variance with the help of this figure. Let's say you modeled out your mean points right you've got your mean points done 
and uh, the dotted line over here the dotted membership function represents your mean membership function what you want to do is this this looks just like a type 1 membership function right the type 1 membership function looks something like this if it was tri if the Gaussian it looked like this if it was triangular it looked like this and that's your type 1 membership function done it does not really tell you much about what spread might have been there besides this value this membership function type 2 membership function on the other hand enables you to understand the variance that was there besides the mean value this variance at that was composed of multiple membership functions has been modeled beside the mean value this line that you can see over here this line that you can see besides it all these values are different membership functions and uh, this entire area is called uh, is basically your membership is, is a summation of all the membership functions that you have here. this is your upper membership function and this is your lower membership function and this is how you can easily represent multiple membership functions in type 2 fuzzy set but that's not it each of these membership functions that you can see over there all these lines mf1 mf2 and up till mfn they're all weighted they all have certain grade to it which was something we discussed early on and if you look at this line over here right uh, you've got uh, you've got some point x let's say it's some variable right you can, you can have any random variable and it goes through each and every membership function each and every membership function at each and every point has certain weight associated to it which is represented easily over here as you can see mf1 has certain weight associated to it over here mf2 uh, on the other hand has certain weight associated to it over here similarly mfn has some weight associated to it here and that's that's the grade that is attached with each membership function we are sure that you know what let's if if this was 0.1 we knew that membership function 1 has a weight of 0 0.1 to it it's only it's basically it's point 0.9 not there that's what we're trying to uh, model out with the membership function and its weight and this weight if you take it to the 3d plane it would look something like this right this, this figure over here that's what it would look like that's what it would look like and uh, that's what it encompasses that's what it shows each and every single point over here is certain weight value each and every single value over here is certain weight which is similar to what we saw over here and all these weight values when modeled on over here will form a 3d plot in this in this direction basically if you look at this direction if you consider this to be your third axis each and every single membership function has certain weight and that weight models out something like this over here and uh, that is the more that's the that third dimension that you brought in is the more information that you are able to model with a type 2 fuzzy set instead of this thing over here this uh very plain looking fuzzy set you were able to uh, model out a lot more information over here and uh, that's the ability that type 2 fuzzy sets give you now 3d modeling is always very hard we all are aware of the fact it's not easy to understand 3d data because for most for the most part you're dealing with 2d screens like the screen i'm presenting this to you on is a 2d screen we can obviously still present 3d plots on it but for the most part it's not very easy and to you know to be able to model it uh, model this uncertainty that we saw where this variance that we saw very easily we'll be dealing with a new concept called the footprint of uncertainty and what the footprint of uncertainty does is it reduces this 3d plot that you see over here in this circle to shading to basically a gradient present on the 2d plane the uh, the shade that you can see inside this spread that's it's it's a uniform shade of pink some shade of pink i'm not aware of the exact shade but it's uniform right it's equal uh, whatever color gradient density is over here is the same density that's over here if instead it would have been a lot more darker over here and a lot more lighter over here what it would have been implying is the fact that there's a lot more weight associated to these membership functions over here and a lot less weight associated to these membership functions over here and that's how we use the concept of footprint of uncertainty to better be able to model these type 2 fuzzy sets now if uh, there's a case where our shading the gradient present inside this area is uniform right like in this case as you can see this shade of pink is perfectly uniform all way across the area that encompasses it means that the set is an interval type to fuzzy set and what that actually means is that there's an equal amount of weight to each membership function each membership function is equally likely to happen and this plot over here it's a gaussian membership function has 
this constant weight associated to each and every membership function inside it, which means that this is an interval type to fuzzy set. Now, why interval type to fuzzy sets or fuzzy systems? Because they're very simple, they're very simple to handle, you know, they're very easy to model out. There's not much computational difficulty associated with them. And frankly, they're, they're the simplest to understand out of the whole bunch of them. What you can see over here, you can see, you can see a triangular fuzzy set, right? And you can see certain variance with it, certain area associated with it. You can see the shade is uniform, which tells us that it's an interval type to fuzzy set. But you can also see these wavy lines, right? You can see these squiggly lines. Now, for somebody who is more mathematically inclined, these wavy lines mean a lot, right? There's a lot of stuff. That's a lot of interesting stuff that's going on with these wavy lines and how you can represent them. For somebody who's only interested in being able to use fuzzy sets in their model, what you're concerned with are the vertical slices in this data, right? You're concerned with at what value of X, what sort of membership functions are there, what sort of weight each membership function has. So I don't know, let's, if you were to consider this value of X and you, you, what you'd get to know is that certain membership function that runs from this point to this point has a weight of 0 0.9, but certain function that runs from here to here has a weight of 0 0.95. And that's how you basically deal with this data. That's how you understand how much uh, a certain class belongs to a certain label and how they're all subclass together. Uh, this squiggly line that you can see over here, I'll for a better presentation, I'll show it away. This line that you saw over here, uh, I'll remove these parts actually. Yeah, so this, this line that you can see over here is basically the squiggly line that you can see over there in our interval type to fuzzy set. And uh, these are generally used for theoretical derivation. There's this interesting theorem by the name of Mendel-John representation theorem, which greatly deals with the study of these wavy lines. So if you're very mathematically inclined, I would definitely recommend you giving it a read and understanding the core mathematics behind how this all works. And uh, as a simple representation to, uh, you know, before we move on to go over the interval type to fuzzy set for one last time, uh, as we saw earlier, these, uh, these membership functions that this area encompasses have certain weight associated to them. Now, as you can see in this figure, there's there's an increasing weight up till some point, and there's that decreasing amount of weight up to some point. So this is gen this is not a uniform weight distribution. But on the other hand, the interval type two fuzzy set for all membership functions, all let's say there are n membership functions, for all n membership functions has the same amount of weight associated with it, which makes it equally likely for a certain point to belong from to you know to certain membership function. That's this computational ease that interval type two fuzzy set gives makes it the most used interval uh, type two fuzzy set. Moving on, we'll go on to intuitionistic fuzzy sets. And for intuitionistic fuzzy sets, I'll, what I like to do is I like to bring back an old example. So what we'll do is we'll go back and copy an old example. Yeah. So we'll copy this. Okay. I don't know why I'm not able to track i'm not able to drag on it yeah okay works so as we saw earlier we considered the example of good students and bad students right we made this set over there that gives us information about student a so student a has a membership value of 0 0.9 associated with this uh fuzzy set good student Mem uh, student b has a value of 0 0.1 and this gives us 1d information this tells me that okay set has this value to be associated with g this element has this value associated with the set what we want to do with intuitionistic fuzzy sets is we also want to know the degree of non-membership the degree of it not being associated with its with this set and how we'll do this is we'll give this information with it so if our mu value was a degree of membership we'll give it a new uh, value uh, a new value as in the greek symbol new and this will give our fuzzy set more information and we won't so let me drag this back so by doing uh, by forming an intuitionistic fuzzy set i basically got rid of the bad student set that i had to form earlier i reduced my data and i can uh, you know i can become more computationally efficient with it uh, while i was going through the intuitionistic fuzzy sets i came across this fun paper that uh, discussed uh, the the possibility of certain student getting certain uh, you know, forming a certain career with the help of intuitionistic fuzzy sets and Euclidean distance, and it was a really fun paper that discussed how the help of uh, with the help of intuitionistic fuzzy sets with the help of the non 
membership degree they were able to incorporate the euclidean distance which made the problem a lot easier than it would have been and similar to this there's another type of fuzzy set called the hesitant fuzzy sets we discussed a great load on the membership function and how it helps us to you know model data better than the type 1 fuzzy sets hesitant fuzzy sets also incorporate the difficulty that we have in approximating this membership function this example that we used earlier i gave certain value right i gave value 0.9 to a 0.7 to b 0.5 to c but i just give them randomly in real world data i am not sure how much a should, like he scored 98 marks out of 100 so he got a membership value of 0.9 but what if he scored 95 the next time 90 the next time is he still a good student like how do i determine that how do i did how do i model all data that i have into a membership function so that i can form this new fuzzy set that can give me better uh, values to deal with this is where hesitant fuzzy sets comes in they, what they do is they also incorporate probability distribution in their membership functions so it, every membership function uh, has a new degree and uh, an element in this function is a member of the set which contains several possible values between 0 and 1 and therefore now you have even more power to make a better decision making model you can accurately describe more circumstances now these three four types of fuzzy sets that we discussed are used in fuzzy logic systems right you have to develop a system we discuss sets and how these sets are worked around with but at the end of the day what you're dealing with is crisp inputs and crisp outputs you get in crisp data you get in the student marks that we got in in the earlier case that you get in student a scored this many marks b scored this many marks c scored this many marks but at the end of the day you want to know whether this student is a good student or not a bad student or not how you, and how you do it is with the help of a fuzzy logic system you pass in your inputs into a fuzzy fire and you use some rules to make inferences now what can a rule look like right a rule basically is an if then statement so in our case it would have looked like this if student a scores marks greater than 90 and less than 100 classify him or then he is a good student and if student a scores less than 50 marks then which is the classification part then the student is a bad student that's what a basic rule looks like in the heart of an fls system you get your rules you get your fuzzy outputs and you defuzzify them right so you passed in student a scored 98 b scored something c scored something you applied your rules and at the end you got a good student b good student c bad student d bad student and that's how you got your crisp outputs back so use the fuzzy logic system to determine what your output was what your class labels for 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 some given data for some tabular data let's say now there's some uncertainty associated in every fls which is noisy measurements right you can always get noisy training data and also there's this there's this data pertaining problem right you are, you don't get a lot of data every time you go out and try and find data so you're always dealing with a lot lot less data than there's out there and you need to be able to counter this with the help of probably some sort of augmentation technique or some sort of better modeling technique that you might have some approximation technique so that's some uncertainty you deal with in the fls as well and you need to take care of that uh and uh, now we we'll move on to applications for these fuzzy sets and logic systems we discussed some the- theory of the fuzzy set we didn't de- dwell deep into the mathematical stuff but uh, now we're going to talk about the applications fuzzy sets are used large and abroad in natural language processing right there's the google search engine which uses a lot of fuzzy set theory and there's some there's some work that that's been done and there's some work that's left to be done and it's all pertaining to fuzzy sets so there's this good example that i mentioned over here if you go to google search engine and if you ask a question and you uh, frame it as age of jofri hinton you'd get 74 as your correct display but if you would ask the question as to how many years has jofri hinton been alive for google will not be able to accurately answer that question you can try that out right now it still does not answer back accurately and you know it's because there's some uncertainty in this question the first question was very direct it was age of jofri hinton there are two there are two main words uh two main word packs and you got your uh, result back but in the second question there's there's a lot more variables to be accounted for there's a lot more words to be checked for and the search engine is not able to properly determine what words are important and what how many years it basically a correspondence for the word age but google search engine is not able to you know properly deal with it and there's that's where you can use some fuzzy set theory you can 
give certain membership values to each word and you can you try and model out and basically allot some value to here which corresponds to uh, uh, you have your data in the back end and you have your front end questions what you can do is you can basically allot some membership value to the questions that you get and certain membership value to the data that you already have and if they correspond you can display that output which is something uh, MIT CZL started working on in their natural language question answering system called START there's also certain problems with it if you ask a question called uh, if you ask the frame it the question as show me how a tiger looks like which is bad english right but uh, that's that's the sort of data you get in real world not everybody is very fluent with english and sometimes people ask questions in wrongly constructed language but they should still be able to get the output to something you can get when you search for show me what a tiger looks like so these are problems where fuzzy sets are employed at large and can still be employed so if you're working with something in natural language processing and you're dealing with uncertainty in your data, you can try out using fuzzy sets. Similarly, fuzzy sets are used in reinforcement learning. If you're dealing with reinforcement learning and are particularly working in robotics, I'm pretty sure you use fuzzy sets each and every day in your research because fuzzy sets are used by and large in uh, the logic controllers that are there for robotic systems. If uh, we look at this example, let's say this uh, this dog, robotic dog, wants to move towards the ball, right? There are certain directions it can move, it can either move in this direction or it can rotate by certain degree around uh, its central axis. So what you can do is you can always model out if distance to ball is something, if some quantity, then move, let's say, five steps forward, if uh, angle, if the angle between you, you, you know, the ax this axis and this axis is a certain quantity, then turn right turn left and that's how you use the you know with the help of fuzzy rules and fuzzy sets you can model out better reinforcement learning systems fuzzy sets is not only limited to nlp and reinforcement learning which seem like the most two obvious use cases it's also used widely in computer vision a lot of high level vision problems and uh, low level vision problems make great use of fuzzy sets and it's because uh, let's say you're looking at certain it's you know, looking at an image and in that image, you're trying to classify the number of red pixels. But red is the absolute term given to you. And there are a lot of shades of red present in that image. So different human beings will you know, classify it differently. Some, for some people, a shade of a very dark shade of orange might also be red. And those sort of problems can be you know, taken better care of with the help of fuzzy sets. High level vision also encompasses a lot of fuzzy set theory. Uh, they're generally used in object recognition and scene recognition. And that's something you can explore if you're working in computer vision and you would like to make use of fuzzy sets. You can probably explore some high level vision or low level vision problems. Now, we try to keep this talk uh, as less theoretical as possible, as less mathematical as possible. Uh, but there are some additional resources I would recommend you try out and you read so that you can get a better understanding of what fuzzy sets are, what fuzzy systems are, how type two fuzzy set systems are evolved and how they can be used. And there's some resources that I have uh, put up some supplementary material, which you can find at this link. It's just uh, my name, samuelhoda.com slash random. There'll be a tab by the name of random and uh, you'll be able to find uh, some supplementary material there for this talk, which you can definitely consider.